everybody, and welcome to NBA TV Basketballography. I'm Andre Aldridge. Some legends are made in front of millions of fans, both live and on television. But other great players earn their reputation through more indirect means. Today, we'll tell the story of Connie Hawkins, whose legend began to spread as an 11-year-old phenom dunking in schoolyards around New York City. As he grew older, Hawkins thrilled City fans with his swooping, soaring flights to the hoop. But just as he was ready to break out on a national stage, he was unfairly swept up in a scandal that relegated him to the backwaters of the basketball world. After long stints with the Harlem Globetrotters and spending time in the ABL and the ABA, Hawkins finally got his shot at the NBA at age 27. He was impressive, but most fans were getting their first look at him when he was way past his prime. The Hawk began earning his Hall of Fame credentials in his youth as a sublime presence on the playground. For me, I don't know about a lot of other players, but something that I really enjoyed doing. I mean, it, was, it just comes through my whole life. So I guess in terms of that, it was something that you put your whole soul, your whole body into. I mean, you just pour yourself into it and hopefully you get something out of it. Get your heart out, Michael Jordan. Connie Hawkins. 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 Just like most kids, I started out playing uh, different sports. Uh, I actually was a better track runner when I was younger. I started playing basketball in Brooklyn, in bed the area I was raised in. I learned how to play at the YMCA, Carlton Y, and uh, there was a guy by the name of Gene Smith who was a police officer who came by and in my neighborhood there was four or five players. He would come by every day and get us and take us to the Y, and he was a real stickler for fundamentals. At the very beginning, it was very frustrating and learning how to play the game. It was a lot of practice, it was a lot of hard work. It was after I learned the fundamentals and got, got that down pat, then basketball became a lot of fun for me. The playground was Connie Hawkins' laboratory, where his game began to grow along with his reputation. As he developed a higher profile in the world of New York basketball, he also got an education by watching the pros in action. I used to sneak over to the old Madison Square Garden, and me and my friend used to sneak in there and watch the old Knickerbockers play. Connie wasn't just rooting for the home team. He also became a fan of an all-time great for the Lakers. I used to go watch Elgin Baylor play. Elgin was one of my heroes. He was one of the guys that was doing the flair and going and, and shooting the ball and hanging in the air. And so, yeah, I did take a lot from Elgin. Julio, move! Move, move! I think guys that grew up in the era I grew up in, most of those guys, if they started out playing basketball, it was something that consumed them. It was something that they did all the time. I remember having to play basketball, and uh, sometime my mother would call me to come home and eat. Uh, I wouldn't go home and eat. I would just stay out on the basketball court. When we played basketball in the playground, it was very physical and uh, it was very competitive. We play. Uh, We'd be there at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning and wouldn't leave till 5 or 6 in the evening. I played against the older guys all the time because I was tall for my age. So I, I was constantly being played against bigger guys and older guys. And very seldom that I played against guys my, my age and my peer group. And I think for me, I think it helped out a lot because the big guys always challenge you all the time. Um, I, I remember playing some schoolyard games where we were playing like for 25 cents. And uh, it was like uh, five on five basketball. And the score would be 9-9, and they said the next guy who scores the basket is going to win the game. And we'd be out there for about three, four hours trying to score the next basket because every time somebody got near a shot, somebody would knock somebody down, somebody would get hurt. So it taught you how to be real competitive, and it, and it, and it taught you a lot about stamina. Now, once you get out on the court, uh, you got to go out there and prove yourself all the time, especially out on the playgrounds. And that's where I learned all my skills at, on the playgrounds. Um, I used to play a lot of times in, in Harlem in the Rucker Tournament. Ah! I think some of our best games were played at the Rucker Tournament. Every ball player, whether it was the guys from California or the guys from New York, and either ex or NBA ball players, they would play all the time in this Rucker Tournament. And uh, I remember there was a game against uh, Brooklyn. I played with Brooklyn, and Wilt played with the team from Philly. And we had this game against them, and it was one of, probably one of the best games you've ever seen. But Everybody don't remember it because it wasn't on video, it was just pre-video, so um, it was a great game and I think the thing that I remember was going against Wilt and we had a guy by the name of Jackie Jackson who was like six foot four and he can actually touch the top of the backboard. I've heard people talk about guys touching the backboard, this guy can do it. And we ran a play and Wilt used to shoot this fadeaway jump shot, he used to go up high and shoot it off the glass. So we had a play that we would make Wilt shoot this jump shot and Jackie would come over and block it. And we had the play set up perfect. Wilt went in and turned, shot a jump shot. Jackie came from the weak side and quartered it right at the top of the, of the backboard. 
and the crowd went crazy. People were running around the place and jumping off the fence and almost jumping off the ceilings and stuff, and it, it was just phenomenal. And we looked over at Wilt, and Wilt was staring at us, and he, Wilt called time out, just called time out like that. And everybody was still running around screaming, and back then there wasn't high five. They'd give everybody low five and stuff. Everybody was clapping and carrying on. And then the next 15 plays were dunks by Wilt that I've never seen before in my life. He dunked every single way he can be imagined for Wilt was, used to have a club called uh, Smalls Paradise in Harlem. And after the games were over with, all of us would go over to uh, Smalls Paradise. And back then, none of the guys had any money, so Wilt would always let us in, let us get into the back and give us something to eat and buy us food and talk to us and gave us information. And uh, he was one of my mentors, and he always uh, told me what to do and what not to do. Connie's performances at the Rucker tournaments caused his reputation to spread beyond New York City. Imitating the soaring moves of Elgin Baylor, he earned a nickname. Hawk and the celebrity that accompanies a rising star. You were a playground legend, and you were in, in, like I said, in a specific city like New York or Chicago. All the players that played in those areas knew you from a schoolyard legend. If you were in New York and you were real good, somebody in Philly would find out about it, and then they would tell somebody in Chicago. Because I remember sometimes we would get into a car and would go to uh, Philly to go play against the top players there, to find out who was good there. We'd go up to Washington, D.C. and play in this place up there. So there was like a little cult among ourselves that knew who were the top schoolyard players. I consider myself a playground survivor, uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, a lot of guys that I grew up with playing in the same schoolyard uh, didn't survive, um, never got out of high school, uh, never made it to the college, and never really fulfilled their dreams. Push it, push it. I established my style probably after playing with the Globetrotters and uh, learning how to do a lot of dribbling and, and controlling the basketball. After the Trotters, it was on to the next phase in Connie Hawkins' career. As he would explain in his biography, the betting scandal kept him from joining the NBA. But there was a new league hungry for talent. The NBA was a real fun league. Most of the ball players were like uh, real good guards and real good forwards. We didn't have a lot of great centers, but we had real good forwards and real good guards. And it was a real good flashy game and guys were allowed, were allowed to score and, and run a lot. And I think that helped me out a lot too because the, the game was real fast and uh, you, you got your offensive skills involved. In some ways, it was a perfect marriage. A fledgling league and an untested player, both with something to prove. Hawkins embraced the challenge, using the ABA as a stage to showcase his abilities. The first year, it was really wide open because we really didn't know which way we were going. Um, we were being trying to be competitive with the NBA, so they were trying to try and get guys to score a lot of points and make, make exciting plays. Oh, I was strictly finesse. Playing a forward slot, I was like 6'8", and uh, at 6'8", I was, I was a pretty good leaper. And then the thing that really that separated me from most of them was that I had these big hands and I was able to grab the ball one hand and dunk. If I went up for a shot like this and somebody tried to block it, I was able to move it over here or move it around and dunk it. Hawkins led the league in scoring with 27 points a game and earned the ABA's Most Valuable Player Award. But more importantly, he led the Pittsburgh Pipers to the inaugural league title in 1968. The ABA championship for me was probably the biggest thing that ever happened to me. And, uh, I mean, it felt like a championship. It actually felt like we were the best team in the world at the time. And I remember it was me, Tom Marcheton, Chico Vaughn, Charlie Williams, Art Heyman. We had a real good ball club, and we were playing against uh, my adversary, Doug Moe, who was from Brooklyn. And I remember the series got tied 3-3, and we had to go play the fourth game back in Pittsburgh. And at the time, we didn't have a lot of fans. And I remember walking into the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, and it was like, the game was like at 7, and I, you get there like a couple hours early, and I got there around uh, 5.30 or 6, and I remember walking in, I heard all this humming and humming, and I looked up, and the stands were packed. There was 12,500 fans there already, and I think that's the thing that kind of helped us out, because we packed the house that night, and we wound up beating them for the championship. Not only did I enjoy my ABA experience, I think that helped me out a lot in terms of developing as a ball player, and more importantly, and if you check the records, most of the guys that left the ABA that went to the NBA became superstars right away. So I never bought that theory of being inferior. In 1969, the NBA lifted its ban on Hawkins. Connie joined the Phoenix Suns as a 27-year-old rookie, and he was thrilled to finally realize a lifelong dream. 
For me, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to my life because I had always wanted to play in the NBA, and I guess a lot of ball players uh, that never get a chance to play against the best, uh, you know, that's the thing that you want to find out, how good you really are. Hawkins had no trouble measuring up. He averaged nearly 25 points in his first season, good for sixth in the league. He also was named to the All-NBA First Team while introducing his unique style to a new audience. They bring it to Connie Hawkins, top of the key. He looked Paris under the Salas. He's got it. Layup. For the most part, uh, the one hand started with the fact that I found out that if I could like um, hold one guy off with my left arm and use my right hand, uh, it was a lot easier for me to control the basketball. When I came into the league, I think most of the forwards that played the game, they played it at a physical type game. I was a more of a finesse type player. When I played with the Phoenix Suns, uh, we had a banger on the other side, Paul Salas, and he used to always get upset with me because he told me that I was strong. you're doing so if you want to talk about uh, being really creative I think good defensive players force you to be creative Honey Hawkins he of the incredible moves for an example the late Gus Johnson playing against him he was a real physical player and I was able to make great moves against guys that were great defensive players because of the fact that they would actually dictate like you have to make one move to get away from them then you have to make another move and then like if you got to the basket there was a center back there trying to block your shot so you have to create another move so it was almost like um, three or four stages where you have to create different moves. Hawkins, oh my. I watched Connie like soaring. That's the way he used to, he used to glide and soar to do his thing. Um, made it look so easy. The expansion Phoenix Suns were only one year old when Hawkins arrived on the scene. Along with newcomer Paul Silas, Connie led a remarkable 23 game turnaround. But Hawkins had a lot of help he was one of three 20-point scorers on a very talented team. Back then, uh, Jerry Colangelo was the general manager and coach, and we had a lot of good ball players: uh, Gail Goodrich, Dick Van Arsdale, and Lamar Green. And uh, I think that's the thing that helped me out a lot, playing with a good team. The Suns made their first ever trip to the postseason, where they met the defending Western Division champs. The thing that I remember, we played against the Los Angeles Lakers in the playoffs, and we were up 3-1. to one. And uh, we thought we were going to beat them. But then Jerry West and uh, Wilt and Elgin turned it on and shut us down 4-3. to three. Connie, he was unique because for a player his size, he had unusual skills and ability, body control. And he was an exciting player to watch. The first All-Star game at 6-8 from Iowa, Connie Hawkins. Hawkins made the All-Star team his rookie season, the first of four trips to the game. He reveled in the fact that he was considered a star among his peers. For someone who was denied the opportunity to play college ball and spent years trying to get into the NBA, this was the ultimate validation. Connie Hawkins against Davis. Ten seconds left in the game. Hawkins, drive, hey. Oh, what a shot. Brother. Incredible. They clear it out for Connie. 58 seconds, that's Connie for the jumper, good! Hawkins went on to play for the Lakers and the Atlanta Hawks. After a few years in the league, he finally had the feeling he belonged. Once I got into the NBA and played against the top players and was able to make the all-star team and be on the all-pro team, then I knew I had arrived. The 2007 NBA China Games is on! Basketball TV is ready to give you NBA China Games merchandise. Just give us your reasons why I love this game. Not more than 20 words. Email your entries to promo at btv.com.ph on or before October 21, 2007. You helping me out? You my helper? What are you doing? Yeah. I'm helping yeah. you. I'm helping 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 you. I look around now and I, and I ride by and I go to different schoolyards and I see them basically empty. And it just scares me because when I was playing, you know, you went around all the schoolyards, the schoolyards were always packed with players. And you'd be out there all day, guys fighting and scratching and learning. And it made me be a survivor. score, Magic. They got one. Sons got zero. Zero. Come on, y'all on TV, you better score. Somebody's got to score over here. Watch out for this. Go, go.
Whoever scores this shot wins. Working with kids reminds Connie Hawkins of his long journey to stardom. Now, he's considered one of the best players in history, but he recalls a time when playing in the NBA was a distant dream. Back then, I, I think when I was in public school, I was like maybe 5'8", five, 5'9", five, 130 pounds, you know. And I was like, they just called me long, tall, sound. I was like this tall and this thin. And then look back on it then, it was just like, just out going out there having fun, you know, just trying to play and be competitive. So, I mean, start from there to get to where I'm at now, it just is an accomplishment within itself. The New York City playground legend had reached the pinnacle of his profession. In 1992, he was elected into the Basketball Hall of Fame. It was the most important thing in my life because at first, I remember doing an interview on uh, ESPN, and he asked me on TV how I felt about not making it to the Hall of Fame. And I said, well, I, didn't, I don't care about it because, you know, I think I was a great ball player, and if I don't make it, it didn't matter. Well, that was my ego talking, and uh, I really wanted to be in. And once I got into the Hall of Fame, it was important for me because my whole family was there, and they experienced it with me. And uh, I think that was the pinnacle of my whole career, getting into the Hall of Fame. Normally, I would start out with trying to have the ball here. As soon as I faked him and he leaned, then I would take a one giant step to the basket. Basketball to me basically was my life. Uh, when you talk about basketball, you talk about, say for an example, uh, an artist like Vincent Van Gogh, he's a painter. And if you took away his easel, I mean, he would cut off his ear. For me, basketball, if you took away basketball, I'd probably cut off both my ears. Sonny Hawkins! Sonny Hawkins! Sonny Hawkins! Sonny Hawkins! Sonny Hawkins. Sonny Hawkins. Connie's number 42 was retired by the Suns in 1976, and he was the first Phoenix player elected to the Basketball Hall of Fame. He has kept his ties with the Phoenix franchise in his retirement, serving as a Suns community representative. Well, that wraps up our look at Connie Hawkins. We'll see you next time on NBA TV Basketballography. Basketballography. I'm Andre Aldridge. Today we present a man who pioneered the point guard position in the NBA. Nicknamed the Houdini of the hardwood, Bob Cousy unleashed a flashy style that was decades ahead of its time. A variety of no-look passes, spinning dishes, and behind-the-back feeds made Cousy one of the most popular players of his era. But there was plenty of substance to go along with that style. In a career that spanned from 1950 to 1963, he led the league in assists eight consecutive times and was consistently ranked near the top in scoring and free throw percentage. He was also a proven winner, helping to start the Boston Celtics dynasty with six titles in the late 50s and 60s. So now the story of a 13-time All-Star, a league MVP, a Hall of Famer, and one of the 50 greatest players of all time. A tale that begins, interestingly enough, across the ocean in Europe. I was fabricated overseas in France and made it like three months after the boat landed at Ellis Island. This was in 1928, not a good year. And the heart of the Depression, and we lived in this nice ghetto area on East End Avenue and 81st Street, Yorkville, Manhattan. Up to that point, despite, you know, B-ball being associated with NYC, I had never saw a basketball. But thank God it took my dear old dad literally 12 years to save 500 bucks and get us out of that ghetto and out to Long Island where there was a little fresh air, uh, St. Albans, where every kid in town simply wanted to play basketball for the local high school. 
I momentarily went out for baseball and just lost interest because my having to go to baseball practice interrupted my going to the school. I had to play three on three. I said I gave that up and we exclusively uh, played uh, b-ball. Uh, at some point during my junior year, somebody grabbed me, I don't remember who, and said, hey kid, you know, you may have some talent, you might get a scholarship. None of us were thinking about, you know, uh, being able to go to college or afford college in those days. But this guy said, hey, you know, you're a C student, why don't you stay awake uh, in your senior year and, you know, you just don't want to get a scholarship, you want to go to a good school. So I, I pretty much did that uh, and stayed awake and became a B, B-plus student. And uh, I was all city my last year, which for New York was kind of a big deal. I was deluged with two college offers. Uh, you helping me out? You my help? What are you doing? I want to pay. I want to pay. Come on. I look around now and I, and I ride by and I go to different schoolyards and I see them basically empty. And it just scares me because when I was playing, you know, you went around at all the schoolyards. The schoolyards were always packed with players. And you'd be out there all day, guys fighting and, and scratching and learning. And you made me be a survivor. Score, Magic. They got one. Sons got zero. Zero. Come on, y'all on TV, you better score. Somebody's better score over here. One nothing. Go, go. Whoever scores this time wins. Working with kids reminds Connie Hawkins of his long journey to stardom. Now, he's considered one of the best players in history, but he recalls a time when playing in the NBA was a distant dream. Back then, I, I think when I was in public school, I was like maybe 5'8", five, 5'9", five, 130 pounds, you know, I was like, they just called me long, tall, sound. I was like this tall and this thin, and then look back on it then, it was just like, just out going out there having fun, you know, just trying to play and be competitive. So, I mean, it starts from there to get to where I'm at now. It just is an accomplishment within itself. The New York City playground legend had reached the pinnacle of his profession. In 1992, he was elected into the Basketball Hall of Fame. It was the most important thing in my life because at first, I remember doing an interview on uh, ESPN, and he asked me on TV how I felt about not making it to the Hall of Fame. And I said, well, I, didn't, I don't care about it because, you know, I think I was a great ball player, and if I don't make it, it didn't matter. Well, that was my ego talking, and uh, I really wanted to be in. And once I got into the Hall of Fame, it was important for me because my whole family was there, and they experienced it with me. And uh, I think that was the pinnacle of my whole career, getting into the Hall of Fame. Normally, I would start out with trying to have the ball here, as soon as I faked him and he leaned, then I would take a one giant step to the basket. Basketball to me basically was my life. Um, when you talk about basketball, you talk about, say for an example, uh, an artist like Vincent Van Gogh, he's a painter. And if you took away his easel, I mean, he would cut off his ear. For me, basketball, if you took away basketball, I'd probably cut off both my ears. Tony Hawkins, Tony Hawkins, Tony Hawkins, Tony Hawkins, Tony Hawkins. Connie's number 42 was retired by the Suns in 1976, and he was the first Phoenix player elected to the Basketball Hall of Fame. He has kept his ties with the Phoenix franchise in his retirement, serving as a Suns community representative. Well, that wraps up our look at Connie Hawkins. We'll see you next time on NBA TV Basketballography. <laughs>